on. Okay, well, thank you. Great. Um, I think the, the uh, so it's, but it's, it's fascinating that it, at no point does Paul really engage in any kind of description or mention of any of these things. Um, I see he never mentions particular people by name um, in his greeting, at least. Maybe later in the letter, he does mention a few people. But at the end of the day, it would appear, uh, we see that in this letter later on, he says, cause this letter also to be read in Laodicea and let the letter from Laodicea also be read among you. So that he, he may have simply written these letters in a kind of a general way to the area. Now, Ephesus would have been the big city in the area. It's kind of like, you know, you got Washington, D.C. and you got Hyattsville and you've got Silver Spring and you've got Arlington, you know. So yes, they're different city names, but it's an area, the Washington DC area. So I think the best way to understand this is that Paul wrote this letter in a more general way, not simply to the city of Ephesus and the people living there, but um, to, um, you know, to their, uh, you know, to, to the general region that included places like Thyatira, um, Laodicea, Sardis, and so on. All those cities in a, what we call today Asia, I mean, today T Turkey, what that was called in the ancient world, Asia Minor. All right. Now, another thing about the Ephesians is that um, <clears throat> Paul was in prison when he wrote it. He was in, um, in Philippi and he was in jail. Um, and he wrote, he wrote this letter to the Ephesians from there. Um, or it's possible if he wrote it later that he was imprisoned in Rome. We, so those are the, the two possibilities. Um, let's see, a couple of other things. Um, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Uh, oh, another interesting thing is that um, uh, Ephesians is especially written to a Gentile audience, even though the, the city of Ephesus also had a large Jewish Christian population. Uh, so it's, it's, that's another clue that this letter may have been written to a wider audience, all right? Um, any other quick notes I wrote down here? Um, for example, uh, it's interesting. Paul says here in the very beginning, we'll read it here in verse 15 in the first chapter, I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus. Well, I mean, he spent three and a half years there. What do you mean heard? You know, he he had experienced it. So, so again, for this reason, a lot of scholars uh, would say that, yeah, it's written more to the region, like the Washington, D.C. area, if I can put it in modern language, or the greater Florida region, <laughs> you know, the area around Tampa or uh, wherever, you know, you get the idea. So, um, and that's, I think, probably the best way to take it. Um, then um, it's, it's um, uh, anything else here? Yeah, I, there's no, there's not really serious doubt about Paul's authorship of the letter to the Ephesians. There's always going to be a few scholars. That, that they're they're going to doubt almost everything. But um, at the end of the day, um, there is so a significant difference in his vocabulary here. And that could be explained in a couple of ways. Sometimes the scribe that you would uh, uh, employ would use, you know, a certain style or vocabulary. Uh, at other times, uh, Paul was trying to be more formal uh, and less informal because, and that's another clue, he'd be rather informal normally in writing to the Ephesians, if you, having lived there for three years with them. But because his language is much more formal here um the um you know the um this yet, yet again another clue okay all right um so any any comments or questions before we get into the text itself i i've learned uh from experience that um um most people don't don't like a lot of the introductory material they want to kind of get right into the text you know and i don't blame you because the text is the word of god <laughs> and all the other stuff is just scholars' opinions about when and how it might have been written and, you know, all of that. And that can be helpful, but I think we a lot of people like to get into it. But before we do go into the text, any comments or questions about it? 
By the way, have, have any of the rest of you been to Ephesus other than myself? Okay. <clears throat> Ephesus. No. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I, I was just saying, unfortunately, no. Not, oh. not, yeah. You know, I, I want to uh, say that the, the ruins of Ephesus are quite impressive. Um, and they're doing a lot of good archaeological work there. Um, um, there's, a, there's a lot to be said for, um, it's, it's just an, an awesome reminder, though, that, you know, Ephesus was one of the great cities of the ancient world. And now it's like, you know, basically under sand. And um, there's a lot of things that happened. The river silted out. Uh, there were earthquakes, uh, a number of things that, that, that caused the demise of the city of Ephesus. But um, it's a reminder to all of us, you know, that we have here no lasting city. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's amazing to us. Uh, so that when I was back, not this November, but the, the previous November in 2019, before 2020, which is over, thank God. Um, um, I walked through Corinth, I, I, another great city of the ancient world, all in ruins. Um, you know, how does that happen? Can you ever imagine in you know, like Washington, D.C. or New York or, you know, Chicago in ruins someday, you know? And yet, you know, if, if history if history is what it is, uh, the best predictor of the future is the past. And one day, for reasons that we don't understand now, those cities, these cities will probably too also be in ruins. So we'll, uh, we'll just have to, you know, hope and pray that it doesn't happen during our time. <laughs> no, but anyway, at any time, but you get the idea. Many, many great cities of the ancient world are now in ruins and it is a, a legacy or if you will, a, a lesson for us, including by the way, Jerusalem, you know, Jerusalem's been rebuilt now uh, as a modern city, but it, it was utterly destroyed in 70. Not one stone was left on another. So, okay, so we've welcomed a couple of people. Um, John is here, and um, who else just came in? Well, anyway, we'll, uh, we welcome you. All right, with that in mind, would you like to, um, would somebody like to read tonight? <clears throat> what we'll do is uh, let's read the first, just the first two verses as an introduction, okay? So. I'll read if no one else wants to. Okay, good. Oh, Angelica? I, I was unmuting myself. Um, okay. Yeah. Paula? No, Joy's going to read. Yeah, I got it now. I, I, oh, I misunderstood. Yeah. Go ahead, Joy. Just let me know if you get tired. I'll All right. You up. Okay. I'll switch. I'm here for you, Stephanie. That works. Um, <clears throat> Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, that beautiful greeting, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What if every one of you just memorized that and would often say that to people? <laughs> Isn't that a beautiful greeting? We say, hi, hello. <laughs> but, um, and that's fine. But at the end of the day, isn't this a beautiful greeting, mm -hmm. right? Um, Paul, How would said, it sound in another language? Okay. Gracias, Pax, Adeus, Pater Noster, et in Jesu Christus. That would be Latin. Mm -hmm. yeah. Pax, yeah. you know, you know, all those, all those different ways that we do the blessings, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Can I say one thing about the first chapter? It yeah. is um, maybe five or six years ago, this woman of great prayer. Mm -hmm. I pray for her, though. She did leave the Catholic Church, to, but mm -hmm. she learned the word of God. Mm -hmm. She actually told me, whenever you see the word you or us from the first chapter of Ephesians, mm -hmm. insert your name and read that to yourself. Mm -hmm. So actually say grace to Charles, Carlito, mm -hmm. and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Say that to yourself with your own name over and over again. Well, thank you for that. That's uh, amen. <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah, put your own name in that sentence. It's a beautiful idea. 
I want to, um, it says here, but it says here, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, notice, by the will of God. Hmm? No one uh, claims apostleship on his own. No one, as, saying, as uh, the book of Hebrews said regarding the priesthood, no one takes this office upon himself, right? But rather he is chosen from among men uh, to be their representative before God. And that's even more so with the case of an apostle. Now, as you know, apostoline means someone who is sent. Um, so that, how do we distinguish the apostles from their successors, the bishops? And there's actually a very interesting way of doing that. You'll notice that the apostles were given a mission unto the ends of the earth, whereas a bishop who has the office of an apostle, but he is expected to remain in a place. His, the literal Greek word for um, an apostle, I mean, uh, for bishop is episkopos, which means an overseer, one who stays in a place and oversees, you know, that, that church. So what's the main difference then between, say, an apostle like Paul or Barnabas or Peter or any, you know, any of the 12, Matthew, Mark, James, you know, all of them, they, um, they were apostles, but they traveled. They were not in one place. Whereas a bishop is expected to be in situ, you know, in one place and, and, and to administer that church. So he's not expected uh, to move about. And, so right here in the Archdiocese of Washington, mm -hmm. under the Archbishop Gregory, how mm -hmm. many active bishops are there in the DMV or Maryland District in Virginia area would be considered active bishops? under the archdiocese well it's a little it, the way you ask the question is complex the archdiocese of washington um is is not um it's its own archdiocese and arlington is a different diocese um we do have another sea that we're connected with namely the virgin islands they paired us with the virgin islands to make us an archdiocese thinking that the nation's capital should be an archdiocese, not just a diocese. But you include Maryland in that as well. Yeah, there are five Maryland counties, Montgomery, PG, Chuck County, we call it sometimes, in other words, Charles County, uh, St. Mary's County, and uh, Calvert County. And so, yes, there are five Maryland counties that are part of the archdiocese. We have right now three bishops. Uh, we have Cardinal Gregory, who is the Cardinal Archbishop, and then two assistants. Uh, one of our assistants just got transferred to Buffalo, so we have a we have an opening, so to speak, for a, a new bishop. Whether that'll be done or not, I don't know. But the point is that um, currently we have three bishops here. Now Arlington has one bishop and no auxiliary bishops, and I don't know why that is. I think it's, a, it's in some ways a larger diocese than ours. It, it's it's more widespread geographically, but they don't, they don't have an auxiliary bishop. Yeah. So I don't know why. They use, um, Cart, um, not Cardinal, but they use Bishop Orleo quite often. He does a lot of confirmations and okay. Bishop Emeritus Laverde, Laverde still is busy. So they're keeping so, him busy. Good. Good for them. Yeah. 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 So the, the, those are three covering all that territory in the Northern half of the state. Yeah. Okay. Super. Okay, well, I'm certainly glad. I know they, I know they have help, but it's just that there's no official for whatever reason. Um, anyway, now uh, getting back then to the text, uh, it says here to the saints. Mm -hmm. Now, you and I, we tend to think of saints as people up in heaven who've been canonized. You know, they're on the calendar somehow, uh, or even if they're not on the calendar, you know, they're somewhere up there with God. Uh, in heaven. And uh, so the, um, the the question then comes, well, what does Paul mean here by calling them all saints? Now, I have answers, but I want to just get your answers before I just throw a, an answer at you. But it's a, it's a provocative answer that I have. I know that, I don't know if this is, a, but uh, well, anyways, I know plenty of Protestants who just refer to each other as saints um, mm -hmm. because they, in their view, have like 
and I guess it's still complicated, but um, they, I think they just view that they've already been saved um, fully. Um, and I think we have the view that we're like, we have been saved, we, we will be saved and we are being saved. So, yeah. mm -hmm. um, but I wonder if it's just kind of, um, yeah. I don't know if you're, if you're in relationship, is it kind of maybe, uh, it's like if you're in relationship with, with the Lord and um, you have that connection that hasn't been broken by mortal sin, um, maybe he's kind of referring it in that way. Like you're part of the church and you're, you know, yeah, growing in him. So you're considered yeah. in his. Yeah. You pretty accurately reported what a lot of Protestants say about a text like this. And, yeah. you know, cause you, cause you know, you talk to them. So now that, as you know, joy will probably not be the answer I ultimately come up with, but you're correct in reporting that this is how very many Protestants see it. Mm -hmm. They kind of, you know, they're already saved. In other words, they have an idea of imputed righteousness or justitia aliena, they call it in, in Latin. That, uh, I, I'm, uh, that justice is conferred to me by Jesus Christ like you throw a blanket over somebody and don't see their filthy undergarments. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, you, there's snow, pardon the expression, but this is how Luther put it, uh, snow on a dunghill. You know, it covers it. Um, and so they have a very legalistic or legal sense of righteousness. And so we're saints because we're, we're still sinning, but, but God covers that and doesn't acknowledge our sins any longer. So that would be one way they would certainly answer. So you're correct. You know. How about encouraging, just encouraging them onward? So he calls them saints to encourage them to do better. Okay, nice, not a nice pastoral explanation, Greg. Uh, Craig, but but not mine. <laughs> anyway, I didn't think so. That's <laughs> okay. I'm toying with you a little bit. You don't understand. But uh, I'm just trying to say that uh, this is, in a way, there's a very provocative thing here that Paul is reminding us of. Um, so if there if there are, any, are no more guesses, I mean, not, not that you're these aren't guesses. I, you know, don't get me wrong. That's but if there are no more answers, I'll give you mine. And again, mine isn't like, hey, man, this came from heaven, man. This is, you know, the official answer. It's not as though, but, okay, so the word here is um, agios in the Greek, and then the, the Latin would be sanctus or the, the sancti, the saints. Now, this word comes from the, um, from the Hebrew, uh, kahal, meaning sacred. Saint, you know, saint, but but it's different than what we often think. If something is sacred, or someone is sacred or saintly, they are set apart. Mm. They're different. So you have, you might have in your house, less and less people have this anymore, but the special china that you only bring out for special occasions, uh, when uh, some some guests are coming and you. You bring them, maybe they have the, their, their special plates and cups and things. And uh, my mom always had that special china. And it was literally, fig physically set apart and put away in a, in, a in a cabinet and only brought out for special usage. And this is the image of, of meaning this, this idea of holy. Holy, literally in Hebrew, Hebrew is a very physical language. And it means to be literally taken and moved over here, taken, set apart, different, mm -hmm. not like the rest, in a different league, different category, however you want to put it. So that's the vision of the, um, the word holy. Now, therefore, the question for you and me is <clears throat> how set apart and different and quote holy are we? Do we look and say, now that doesn't mean you got to wear exotic hair or strange clothes or, you know, you know, that's not what, that's not what, we're not looking to be idiosyncratic, but how do you look and sound and behave differently from the people in the world around you? That's the challenge of the word saints. You who are set apart, you who live not the life of the pagan, but the life of the Christian. They, you know, St. Paul describes them elsewhere as, you know, their, their minds are darkened, their intellect is clouded, they indulge the flesh, 
They, uh, they are in, in every way uh, living rapacious and greedy lives. Mm -hmm. um, you, this is not what you were called to in Christ Jesus. You're called to be, quote, different saints, set apart, to look different, sound different, act different, be different. And that's always going to be the challenge for us um, because it's so easy for us to just kind of go along with whatever the culture says, you see. And uh, this is um, a powerful word here to the saints who are at Ephesus. Now, Ephesus made its money by being a tourist destination and also a port. The tourist destination was the, was the um, great temple of Artemis a magnificent, huge, you know, edifice that people would come to visit and they would worship this goddess, Artemis. And Paul said, not for you. Hmm. You're Christians. There's only one God. You, you don't, there is no Artemis to worship. And you'll see here um, later, uh, he will describe the fact that uh, there, you know, it, there was a riot in Ephesus when he was there among the, um, uh, coppersmiths and others uh, the uh, the tutors who made these little statues of artemis and they would sell them you know as, as a little token of coming and um he really cut into their business because he converted a lot of people to the christian faith and so they brought him in the theater and they tried to kill him and so again all of these are just ways of saying that um this um they, they were living in a very pagan city that was very much like any Roman um, city at the time, Gre Gre Greco-Roman city, very, by the way, I'm, I don't want to be too explicit, but there was, I'm putting this in quotes, look at my air quotes here, air quotes, sacred prostitution. Now, what that meant was that, you know, these men would, con would get right with Artemis by being with some prostitute, priestess. And, um, you know, tell me that's not a religion designed by men and for men. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they actually convinced themselves that going to these so-called priestesses, these women priestesses who were really just prostitutes and, you know, consorting with them would get them right with Artemis. You know, I mean, they actually thought of it as a religious act that is sick. <laughs> it's sinful. And so Paul says, you can't, you can't, their minds are darkened. Their intellects are mistaken. They, they don't know. They don't understand. But you, you, you've been taken and you've been set apart for God. You're different, see? You know that's wrong and have nothing to do with it, see? And that's still the call for us to not just simply go along with whatever the culture is saying. So Ephesus was a, was a magnificent Greco-Roman city and it was just as sinful and full of, you know, all that stuff is unfortunately most of them at the time. And um, the Christians were noted for them, for their not engaging in that kind of debauchery. Okay. Yeah. Well, Senior, do you know, um, when you were saying that, do you know the song Refiner's Fire? Mm. Because it has, yeah, it was, it was just, it came to mind as you were saying that. It's okay. one of my favorite songs, but it has the, oh. the line that says, um, set apart for you, Lord. Um, Basically mm -hmm. saying, uh, my my heart's one desire is to be holy, set apart for you, Lord. So, anyways, mm -hmm. it's exactly what set you said. Apart. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Set um, apart, <laughs> sacred, holy saints. Amen. So, is you a saint or is you an ain't? <laughs> All right, sorry. <laughs> Great. Okay, well, let's move on. I don't want to. I know I'm kind of hammering away. We got to move through the text a little more, but but again, we have this beautiful to the saints who are at Ephesus. And are faithful in Christ Jesus, you know. And then again, maybe Craig, that kind of gets to what you were saying earlier. He's, yeah, you're all faithful. Oh, uh, okay, uh, okay, Paul, I'll try to do better. <laughs> it's an encouragement, right? Okay. And then, of course, that beautiful expression, uh, at uh, you, you ask other languages. This is the Greek rendering of it, Stephanie. Um, Karis et arini. Hmm? Um, you know, um, and so uh, gr grace and peace to you from the from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. By the way, in the liturgy, only a bishop can say peace be with you. Um, a priest can't. We're not allowed. We can only say the Lord be with you. It's just one of those little funny liturgical laws. Okay. So, all right. Now here we come then to a hugely important 
set of verses that is what we call the Ephesians hymn. Most scholars, in fact, think that this was actually a hymn uh, from, or at least a, a, you know, an epic poem from the early church. This is a magnificent composition, especially in Greek. It has a magnificent structure and all kinds of chiastic, you know, meanings. And, you know, chiastic means, um, um, it looks like the letter X to us, but it's the letter CH in the Greek alphabet. It's called chi. And so chiastic arguments are arguments that have four parts separated, but they come together in some central thought. So it's a magnificently thing. It's not just something he just wrote sort of extemporaneously. He's certainly quoting something here that either he or someone in the early church composed as a magnificent masterpiece and a hymn. It's one of the hymns of the New Testament. So you'll recognize it. I, I enjoy if you want to read it. Um, you'll recognize it. Um, and I think, um, but, but I would say, it, here's the deal though. Can you read all the way then through verse, um, verse 14? So yeah. mm -hmm. start with three and through 14. Okay. Blessed be, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and, and will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. Yeah. Amen. There's a lot here. Um... I do, again, in Greek, it, it is an, it's a masterpiece. Um, it is a, um, it, it just, there's just no way around it. And I want to point out maybe a couple particular lines to you, but, uh, the, you know, we can, you can ask me about any of the lines, but first of all, listen a little bit to the cadence, if you, if you pardon me, just reading a couple of lines, but blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heaven. Good, and it kind of goes on. There's a kind of a, a hymn-like, you know, rhythm to it. Um, I love this. It says, in him, we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins through his blood. You see, you got to just take a line like that and just pray for 10 years over it. In him, we have forgiveness of our sins through the redemption of his blood. And just sit before a crucifix and just be astonished at the gift that this is, you see. I mean, who of us could ever really say, you know, is my life really worth what he went through? And yet he says, of course it is. I died freely for you. I knew everything you would ever do. And I still died for you at the cost of my blood. So again, there's so much here. Um, but maybe just to, you know, kind of begin uh, to rather move through it. But, but blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So remember, Christ did this for us, but his Father, who is our Father, whatever your earthly Father was like, our Heavenly Father is a perfect Father, and he loves us. And he, he sent his Son. Now you say, why didn't he just come himself, you know? I mean, well, part of the problem with that is that the sin that we committed 
was a sin of disobedience. And um, we, um, we see that, therefore, it doesn't usually pertain to a father to obey a father. It pertains to a son to obey a father. So at least in the order of signs, it makes more sense for Jesus, the son, to come and to obey his father. But you still have a problem. There's only one divine will. There are not three divine wills. That's uh, contrary to our understanding of the Trinity. There's one God, one divine will, one divine nature that three people mysteriously share. So what happens is Jesus takes now up a human nature, which has a human will, which is able to obey his father. So you can see in the order of signs and also in the order of just um obedience the question is why did he not that father not come if he loves us so much why send his son why not come himself the answer would be basically well in the order of sign and obedience um it doesn't pertain to a, a father to obey himself because our main sin was that of disobedience so he sent his son who could obey him for us be a representative and through that you know, bring us, bring us to uh, salvation. So blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every uh, spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now, you say, well, I don't know about that. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places? See? But remember, you and I, we live in time, and uh, we acquire the blessings of salvation in stages. None of us will acquire all of it until we're really there in heaven. But God already knows you in your perfected glory. Don't ever think, well, God's really disappointed me in today. I really screwed up today. God already, this to, whatever today, God always, it's always been present to God. God always knew it. He made you anyway. Uh, God's not waiting for you to get better, waiting for you to get to heaven. All of this is before God now as present, but so that every spiritual blessing in the heavens is now present to us, even if mystically or imperfectly from our perspective is already offered. It's already yours. Now, how we acquire that and begin to live out of it's another matter, right? So let's say that we had an infant who um, um, got a uh, hundred million dollars um, what would that, what would, what would a one-year-old child know about a hundred million dollars? Not much, you know, oh, you got a lot of money, but, you know, at the end of the day, no, they're just, they're just an infant. So they have to grow to appreciate, wow, I've got this thing and I can make use of it for good or for worse. And, and now I'll start to live out of the fact that I have nothing to worry about financially. Um, but at the end of the day, they, they you have to kind of grow into it. To tell even a two or a three year old, wow, y'all got all this money. Well, they want to spend it all on candy, which is just dumb. So again, there, there's a certain sense that God doles out, if you pardon the expression, these blessings to us as we're able uh, to receive them. Now, I, as I've made my journey, I can say there are a lot of heavenly blessings that I much more appreciate now than I ever did when I, let's say I was 20 or 15 or even 25, you know. Um, I appreciate them far more. So, um, again, yeah, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places says he chose us. Listen to this. He chose us before the foundation of the world to be, uh, you know, to, that we should be holy and blameless in his sight and love. D did you hear that? Before the foundation of the world, he knew you. He loved you. He thought about you. He prepared for you. He didn't just get your parents to meet. He got your grandparents and your great grandparents and your great, 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 great grandparents all in just the right combination so that you would be just who you are. It says that Jeremiah chapter one, verse five, before I ever formed you in the womb, I knew you. Psalm 139 says, you know, you Lord, you fashioned me. You knitted me together in my mother's wounds with your hands. I'm, I, I praise you, God, for I'm wonderfully, fearfully made. Awesome are your works. And every, and this goes on in that same Psalm, Psalm 139. Every one of my days was written in your book 
before one of them ever came to be. Are, are you, you know, amazed by this? I mean, you see, we, we, we often think, you're, you know, maybe your parents said, well, you were a mistake or, you know, you were a surprise or I don't know what your parents, might, and I hope they didn't tell you, but, you know, you know, sometimes you were never, you were never a surprise or a mistake to God. He always knew you. He's always loved you. You've always been in his mind and present to him. God lives in eternity. He doesn't live. He's not waiting for anything. He's not remembering anything. Everything is present to him now. He's at center point of the clock. 12, 9, all that stuff, that's where we live, out on the edges. He lives at the center where 12, 9, whatever other is all present to him at once. Everything. Your life is known fully already by God. Right Now, that doesn't fate you. to. You'll have to do this. You have to do that. As if, as if you lose your freedom, because we work out and we live freely, but God has simply always known what we would freely do. And he supplied us with every grace that's necessary so that we could find our way to him and be saved. All right. And we don't always respond well to that. But at the end of the day, that's what he does. So God, it's, it's, it's an awesome thing. He, he knew you and chose you and me before the foundation of the world. What? That we should be holy and blameless in his sight, okay, um, and be before him. So that one day, just like Mother Mary, we say Immaculate Mary, you'll have to say Immaculate Charlie <laughs> and not laugh while you say it. But because, not because of me, but because of God's grace. One day in heaven, you and I, we will be sinless, holy and blameless in his sight will be before him with every tear wiped away, with every glory, with every aspect of what it means to be holy and blameless. This is our future and our dignity if we're faithful, okay? To be holy and blameless in his sights. It says, goes on here and says, um, uh, he predestined us for the adoption, um, uh, I'm sorry, for the adoption to himself of sons, uh, according to, or through, uh, through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, and so predestination, you know, causes a lot of Catholics to stumble. Well, what are we saying here? Now, the, what you we 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 do teach in the Catholic Church that we are predestined, but we do not teach double predestination. What do I mean by that? God predestines no one for hell. That's what double predestination. The Calvinists said some are destined for heaven. Some are destined for hell. And that, no, the Catholic Church said that is not true. God does not create anyone to go to hell. That's not why God creates anyone. He may know what they will do, but he never is the cause. He does not destine them, or if you will, designate them. You're designated for hell because I need some people down there, and you're designated for heaven. So maybe the word designation might help you to appreciate a little more what's going on here. No one is designated by God for hell, right? God freely does make some people he know. He knows, as I've already told you, because he lives outside of time. Uh, he sees all things at once. He knows that they will reject him and they will live apart from him for all eternity. And though he regrets it, he still creates them. Why? Because that's how much he respects your freedom. And we misuse our freedom. Would you trust us with freedom if you were God? I wouldn't. I'd just make us all robots. So we wouldn't screw up and keep killing each other and doing terrible things and abusing each other and all the awful, horrible things that we do. I wouldn't trust us with freedom. But, but God does. You know, apparently his yes is so important to us that he's willing to accept the fact that some will say no. I think Rohana, go ahead. But isn't it possible? Isn't it impossible to love, to love truly without free will? Isn't that right? Exactly, exactly, Rohana. I mean, the reason we, he gave us freedom is so that we can love, and if we didn't have free will, we couldn't love. And God wants children, sons and daughters, who love Him, not slaves or animals who live out of instinct or 
any of that. So you're, you're exactly right. Exactly. Um, um, the, uh, it's, it's because of his respect for our freedom uh, that, uh, and is it because he wants sons and daughters who, who love and you can't, if you're not free, you don't love. Yeah. Well, I look at it a lot is that, yes, God knows where you're going to be. He knows this because mm -hmm. he is to be. I mean, he knows all, he lives at a certain point, but that doesn't stop him in your life of him offering these graces and opportunities for you to mm -hmm. choose your free will. It's just your will choose not to accept the help that he put out. He does that through your whole life. You just mm -hmm. either don't recognize it or whatever, but he continues to do it. It's just your choice. He's yeah. giving you the opportunity. It's your choice to choose or not to. It doesn't stop him from doing that. Even though he knows the end, he still offers those choices, those opportunities. Mm -hmm. yeah. As he never gives you anything more that you could handle and will give you a way out. Well, uh, Kenneth, you were uh, anticipating the next verse here. Um, so uh, I'll just read it to affirm what you just said. It says here, um, uh, verse, I'm, I'm in verse uh, six, I'm sorry, verse eight. I need a mic, I need a magnifying glass. That's my eyes are getting bad. Um, no, verse six. He, he uh, predestined us to the purpose of his will, uh, to the praise of his glorious name, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Um, and, um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I did miss that um, verse. Here it goes. I'm going to start with verse five. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons um, through Jesus Christ, um, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. So every grace that you're saying, Kenneth, every grace that we need is, 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 is offered. Whether we choose to receive it or make use of it or just let it blow past us is another matter, but he's offering it. He's always offering it. This, this beloved, this magnificent grace that he offers us to hear his call and to answer. And so for us, again, the, the, the challenge is always to be open, you see, to that, to that grace. Um, I get, you know, people who sometimes say to me, I don't believe in your God. And I say, why? Because he won't show his face. And they say, well, you know, I, I, I think I, I understand you want to see him according to a way that your flesh understands, right? You know, we, we, when, when photons light up our retina, and then somehow touch our brain, we say, ah, I see you, Yen, I see you, Joy, Craig, Kenneth, I, I, Stephanie, I, I, I see, I see you, but, but, but there's another way of seeing, and I, I can tell you, I've seen him, I experienced his power in my life, and um, that grace is at work in my life, and I have my ups and downs, um, my good days and bad days, but it, overall, my life is, remarkably uh, testimonial to, to the magnificent work of great of God's grace in my life. I love God. I, I, I praise him. He's been good to me. And I'm so happy, so happy, you know, to be, uh, to be with him in this journey. And um, so again, all of these are just ways of saying every grace that he offers us. And so you might say, well, again, but still the question can come up, well, why doesn't God just kind of ride down on a lightning bolt? And say, here I am, I'm God, look at me. And everyone would fall down and be either terrified or glorified. But, you know, at the end of the day, what happens to faith? It goes away. God has decided he wants us to walk by faith, not by sight. Or another thing that might happen, we pardon the expression, but he might scare the hell out of us. Now, that's not free. You know, when you're frightened and you're terrified, I'll do whatever you say, just don't kill me or don't overwhelm me. Um, that's not freedom. Uh, so God knocks. He doesn't barge in and enter. He knocks. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And so these are just some answers I can give you, but they're only really good for the spiritually mature. I've never found they work very well with a very hardened atheist. But uh, I just know from my own perspective that 
so much of the, the harder things about God. Why doesn't he show his face? Why isn't he just obviously present? Why can't we look him up and see him? There he is over there as if God were just one more thing in the universe rather than, you know, ipsum esse subsistens, you know, the, the very act of to be itself. I mean, he is so present that we can't see him in that sense. You know, he's, that's how present he is. It's like talking to a fish about water, you know, what, what water? You know, I mean, so um, there, there's, um, he's so omnipresent that we don't see him with our physical eyes. But I tell you, he is St. Augustine says he is more present to you than you are to yourself. Um, but he does this respectfully and quietly. Who's the one who yells and screams and makes himself known and interrupts us and gets, you know, frightens us? And that's Satan. That's what he does, you see. But God loves you. He respects you. He knocks. He doesn't barge in. Okay. And you might say, well, I think God should do more. Fine. But at the end of the day, that's the best answer I can give. You know, okay. And now, um, to just move on to a few more verses. And, you know, it's getting, we're going to be about five minutes away from ending here. But it says here, um, we have redemption through his blood. I already mentioned that. I mean, just, just think about that for a minute. He died for me. Uh, Kenneth Lewis, who died here recently, uh, our wonderful music director, he wrote a song and he just says, uh, just for me. He did all that just for me. Just for me. So again, just an unbelievable gift. And you should never, when you go to a cru before a crucifix, cease to be astonished that for God so loved me, so loved the world, but he so loved me that he died for me he went through that for me you can never you can just never stop meditating on that and be just amazed amazed at the uh, at the story um there's a, a song i'll share with you later if i have a, have a minute but okay so we have here then uh in him we have forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace again which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight that word lavished, he poured with abundance. So Father uh, Peter Kreeft, meditating on this line, he's a, most of you know, or have heard of Peter Kreeft. Uh, he's a, a theologian and, a, and, a, and a quite a voluminous writer. And he said, why did, if one drop of Jesus' blood could have saved the world, why did he shed all of his blood? And the answer is, because that's what he had to give. He gave it all. He paid it all. See? God's love knows no limits. And so he, he didn't just, you know, one drop of Jesus' blood shed for us could have saved the whole world. Amen? Right? Why then, why was it all poured out? Why did he die, you know, from exsanguination and suffocation? You know, why? Because that's what he had to give. He gave it all. He paid the whole price. Astonishing, astonishing. Uh, it says here that in verse eight now, he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. Uh, as a plan for the fullness of time, to notice this now, unite all things in him, in heaven, and uh, things in heaven and on the earth. Now, there's a very, uh, Father Francis Martin, not James Martin, Father Francis Martin said this beautiful line one day in class. He read this line and he put his Bible down and he, you know, oh, here comes the line. He's coming up with something now. Look out, bud. Just prepare, put on your seatbelts. Prepare for a, and he said, he said, the Lord holds all creation together in himself, but only the church is his body. You go meditate on that for about six years. <laughs> all right. Do you, but do you see what I'm saying? Yes, God holds all creation together, but only the church is his body. There's an intimacy, you see, that we have with him. Yes, Jesus, according to the, the hymn from the letters of the Colossians, he holds all creation together in himself. But there is an intimacy he has with you and me and us together that he doesn't have with all of creation. We're his body, okay? We're his body. All right, so um, if that 
it's enough if, it, if it's enough of a, of a mystery for you to meditate on good you go figure that one out <laughs> okay and it goes on to say here you know um um in in verse 11 in him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will so this is about the sixth time the word will has come up here you see god has carefully orchestrated things for our salvation now the next thing you'll see here is this inheritance brothers and sisters i don't know when the last time you meditated on heaven which is you got to do it a lot we don't really often meditate we know so many sermons today you know people say well we don't hear many sermons on hell anymore father i say you're right and we also don't hear many sermons on heaven and that's a real problem because what god has waiting for us joys unspeakable glories untold eye has never seen ear has never heard it has never even dawned on any of us says jesus what god has prepared for those who love and trust him you've got to begin to understand that we don't we may not be able to know but we ought to yearn for long for heaven it is it's the whole point it's everything that we live for. So my, the, my whole life is directed to this simple thing. I want to die loving God and my neighbor so I can go home and be with God forever. And the joy of heaven is to look on the beautiful face of God. That beautiful face. That you have an infinite longing right now. And nothing in this world will ever really satisfy you. Nothing. Only the Lord. Only the Lord. And when you finally look on his beautiful face, you'll enter into the great dance of love, the uh, perichoresis, the Greeks call it, in heaven, the dance of love that is the life of the Trinity. And long for it, yearn for it, wait for it, run for it, not suicidally. We all might have a few things we'd like to finish up. I get that. But gosh darn it, this whole COVID thing too, you know, all so many of these things, People are so afraid of dying from this world. But if you are a Christian, a faithful Christian, the day you die is the greatest day of your life. Now, I'm not saying COVID is a great thing. I hate it. I had a bad case of it and I'm still suffering from it. Um, but I want to say that um, whatever, whenever day I do die, ultimately, if I'm faithful, it's the greatest day of my life. I get to leave this lunatic asylum and go home where things make more sense and things are more just things are perfectly just and i know i'll need a lot of cl cleaning up maybe even through purgatory but at the end of the day i'm on the way hmm? so all that's just a way of saying um we um you, you need to just let these lines just light up your mind you see you have an inheritance mm -hmm. so awesome so glorious so wonderful that no one could ever describe it for you is what we say unsayable or ineffable. Okay. All right. Finally. I'm senior. Yes, please. Can, can I say one thing about like meditating about heaven? I I went to Catholic schools. Everything you know, uh, essentially like rocking horse Catholic. Um, but I, I don't think the fir I don't think I meditated on like the greatness of heaven until I heard something from Rick Warren because of all mm. that, mm. like the media and Hollywood have done to influence our picture of heaven. <laughs> it's always like this boring white yeah. place. And like Rick, War pastor Rick Warren said, you think the God who made sunsets is going to make a, you know, like a boring <laughs> heaven. And that just kind of <laughs> clarified things a little bit more yeah. for me and just, right, like, right, yeah, right. because I always had that, little oh it's always people just they, they look so holy and they look like statues and that's <laughs> supposed to make us happy and that doesn't seem like happiness yeah no, you're right yeah i think you're right we've been ill served by these sort of dopey images of you know people plucking harps and sitting on <laughs> clouds and kind of looking rather bored actually um but um and you know by the way when i ask people about heaven um often i'll get things like this well i get to see my mother again or i won't lose my job or I won't be, you know, sick anymore. Okay, all that's fine, but that's very egocentric, you notice. The heart of heaven is to be with God. 
And yes, I'll see my loved ones and I'll have the communion of the saints and, uh, you know, I won't be sick anymore, but I mean, I'll be with God. <laughs> the one for whom my heart is crying out, seek always his face, never stop seeking the face of the Lord. Um, but people, it's funny when I ask them about heaven, they almost never get around to mentioning God. <laughs> and that's, that's just, you know, so there's a lot of stuff we got to do a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. You're right. You're right. Yeah. So, hmm. all right. Well, listen, it's getting late. Maybe just the last two lines and I'll just finish with you. Okay. Um, verse 13 in him, Jesus, you've also heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And you believed in him and you were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Okay. There's confirmation for you. Right. And who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Now, the, another translation, this is, I'm reading from the uh, English standard version here, the Catholic version. Um, but I, I think the, um, just there's another translation that goes like this, that we were made for the praise of his glory. We were made for the praise of his glory. Elsewhere, St. Paul says, offer to God your, it sounds strange, but he says, rational worship or sometimes spiritual worship. But um, the idea is that an animal doesn't know God, although it praises God by its existence. But we know what we're doing. We can intentionally praise him. And scripture says that at the heart of our existence is that we were made for the praise of his glory. So how is your praise up to date? Now, what I mean by that is, you know, sometimes we get discouraged or depressed. We kind of get lost in frustrations and little things that go wrong in the world, big things too. Um, but, you know, when we're praising God, I, I can only tell you this. Um, a couple of you, several of you here I know are kind of aware of charismatic worship and and that. And um, I certainly here in, in our parish, uh, an African-American parish traditionally or historically, we don't call it charismatic, but it is. People on the hand, they get their hands in the air, they're up on their feet, clapping and, you know, singing. And, you know, you, when you're in the groove, you just feel great. Because that's why you were made. You're doing what you were made for. <laughs> to offer God a, an intelligent, rational, knowing praise. We were made for the praise of his glory. And that's when we're happiest. I know there's sometimes you don't feel like you're in a mood to maybe put on a gospel song and start clapping. But, but at the end of the day... Um, we were made for this. And that's when we're happiest, when we're doing what we were most made to do. There is just nothing greater than just offering what Paul calls elsewhere rational or intelligent praise. Or in this case, he says, you were made for the praise of his glory. And in heaven, our praise will just reach soaring limits, just soaring heights. And uh, we'll be so alive, so joyful, just singing forever with God. And that's, if we're faithful, our future and our destiny and our dignity. All right, this, this beautiful Ephesians hymn, you know, it's like, wow, you know, who wrote this? Did Paul write it or is he quoting it? I don't know, but whoever the Holy Spirit gave it to, it's a masterpiece in Greek, but it's also, as you can see, a masterpiece in English and it really gives us a lot to think about. So glad we were here to reflect on it tonight. Any comments, questions, rebuttals, or? Best session yet. Thank you. That was beautiful. Oh, oh yeah. But yeah, this Ephesians hymn, you can't beat it, right? The That's Philippians great. hymn is great, too. You know, I quote that one from memory, too, but <laughs> another day. Yeah. Okay. By the way, if you're just looking for an exorcism prayer that you can pray, uh, go to the Philippians hymn. Um, second chapter, I think, of the letter to the Philippians. Jesus Christ, though he was in the form of God. Maybe we'll do this for our final prayer, okay? Since I, I do have it memorized. 
Jesus Christ, though he was in the form of God, did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at, but rather he emptied himself and he took up the form, uh, the form of a slave being born in human likeness. He was known to be of human estate, and it was thus that he humbled himself, obediently accepting even death, death on a cross. And because of this, God the Father highly exalted him and gave him a name above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus, every name was bent in the heavens, on the earth, and under the earth. And every tongue proclaimed to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. Somebody say amen. Amen. And may the peace and the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit come upon you all and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Monsignor, did you have something you wanted to bring up, I think, at the end? Yeah. You know, I wonder, though, um, Angelica, is there something that, I mean, I don't see anybody here that we'd be... There are a couple young men that I see on the participant oh, on line who are in the local area. And um, Joy, I'm actually going to ask you to send a, an email on behalf of Alec Torres uh, oh, sure. uh, in regards to what I'm about to ask, a call for altar servers. So right now the parish is in need of having a few more altar servers, a few more men to stand up and stand in, either at the Norbus Ordo, um, ideally anyone who participates in the 7 p.m., but also in any of the other times that would be be great yeah. um also we uh, monsignor does celebrate the traditional latin mass so you can learn that as well um so what ladies uh, of any ages as well please feel free to nudge family male fa men uh, or friends <laughs> they always need encouragement um so uh please not, no offense guys but um, please stand up, and uh, if you're interested, um, respond back to Joy on that email that I will ask her to send out maybe tomorrow. Great. Okay, sounds good. Just okay. send me maybe like some of those details. I'll send you the copy, and you can just copy Perfect. and paste, and it'll have a form. Perfect. Super helpful. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, nudge. Women <laughs> encourage and nudge. <laughs> that's just uh well okay well i won't i won't translate that i'll just say no just good okay no, um but anyway bless you all thank you for be, uh, being here now next monday i can't be here tomorrow morning i get on a plane pretty early um well i eat 40 that's not early but i got to get to the airport by around 6 30 so i got to get up and uh i do pray uh ask your blessings i go to t uh, talk to 40 bishops and i don't think i'm nervous about that but you just you know you never know. So uh, I could uh, use a, okay. a few prayers, mainly because I just hate being away. But um, okay. here I am. So I'm going. You know, I promised I'd do it, and I did. Mm -hmm. so, you haven't traveled in a while, so. You just... Actually, I did travel to Seattle, you might remember, about a month ago. That's right. Yeah. Not as so much I'm not as you used to. About, I'm not worried about traveling. And when I come back, by the way, just so you all know, I do get tested for COVID. I, I had the antibodies, but... Uh, just, you know, out of an abundance of caution, I don't just walk back into the parish having been with people from all over the country um, and just, you know, mm -hmm. say, hey, I'm fine. Uh, I do get tested, you know. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank Let's you so it. much. Travel safely. May you be filled with the Holy Spirit. Good. Amen. Amen. Talk to you in Safe travels, months. Monsignor. Goodbye, everyone. Good night. Thanks, Bye. Thanks for seeing you. Bless Thank you, you Father, Matt Monsignor. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you, man.